Warning, you may never eat sugar again after watching this video, or at least you'll dramatically cut down the amount of sugar that you consume. And I think everyone knows that sugar is bad. It affects almost every part of your body. It causes weight gain. But what I want to do is I'm going to just take one little thing in your body and talk about the effects of sugar on that one thing. And that is going to be the red blood cells. In fact, the red blood cell is how they measure your blood sugars, okay? And how they even diagnose diabetes through a test called A1C. A1C is a test that measures how much sugar is stuck to the red blood cell. When the red blood cell, or at least the protein part of the red blood cell called hemoglobin is exposed to sugar, there's this chemical reaction or binding that occurs and that's called glycation. So glycation is the amount of sugar that binds with that hemoglobin and that renders it um, inactive. It can't work anymore. And so based on how much sugar you have stuck to your hemoglobin can determine what your A1C is. So let's say, for example, you have an A1C of 5.7 or less, that would be considered normal. And so the term 5.7% just refers to you have 5.7% of the total amount of hemoglobin in your blood that is stuck to this sugar molecule. So if it's between 5.7% to 6.4%, you're a pre-diabetic. And when it gets over 6.4%, you're a diabetic. Now, what does all this mean in simple terms? Well, the red blood cell should normally be very, very flexible. It should be able to hold oxygen and carry oxygen to the tissues, and it shouldn't be very sticky. It should free flow and carry oxygen to the body and release the oxygen, and then also pick up the CO2 and bring that back into the uh, lungs where it can be reoxygenated. So the more that this protein in your red blood cell gets stuck with the sugar, the more your red blood cells are gonna be stiff. It's gonna be very, very sticky, and it's gonna form clumps. And so that increases your risk of getting a clot. But when the red blood cell becomes stiff, it can't bend anymore. So what happens is the blood flows through your arteries into smaller arteries and then tiny vessels called capillaries, they get stuck, okay? And so we have the arteries that push the blood down to the end of your body, like the toes and the fingers. And that's where the capillaries are that then kind of goes in reverse and becomes the venous system, the veins, and then brings the blood back up through the lungs to start this whole cycle over. So the arteries are filled with this red blood that's oxygenated. And then as we use the oxygen, the return blood flow through the veins are like a bluish red because they have less oxygen. But if your red blood cell is not flexible, if it's rigid, if it's stiff, it can't bend, it gets stuck in the capillaries. And then that starves off the tissues. And this is why a diabetic starts noticing tingling and in the fingertips and usually the toes or the bottom of the foot, they start feeling um, an abnormal uh, sensation like numbness or even pain or burning. What's happening is the blood cells are too stiff and they can't seem to get through the pipes. Okay. And then we starve off the tissues with oxygen. We starve off the nerves with oxygen and they start to die. That is the first change that happens on the road to necrosis or gangrene where the tissues actually die. And when the tissues don't get oxygen and they start dying, you start having an increase of unfriendly microbes. It's called pathogens and unfriendly uh, fungus. And so when you have gangrene, you have a lot of infection going on in the body because certain pathogens thrive in this low oxygen environment. And this is where you get amputation when someone's a diabetic. It starts off as peripheral neuropathy where the nerves are affected and then you get the ulcers and then you start getting necrosis or dying tissue and then gangrene, and they have to start to remove different sections of your foot, maybe starting with the toe or the ankle or whatever. So the effects of this interaction between sugar and this protein uh, really messes up the red blood cell. It really brings down the red blood cells ability to carry oxygen. It also reduces the volume of red blood cells. So think about this. If you're anemic, uh, normally people take iron or B12, but is it really going to work on top of this problem where you're your diet is very, very high in sugar, actually creating or causing the anemia. And then you take some iron. Is that going to really help you? The answer is no. Or another symptom related to not being able to carry oxygen. You're going to start climbing stairs and getting out of breath easier. You're going to have a hard time exercising because you're not going to have the wind or the oxygen. And so you're going to get tuckered out really fast. And so you're going to start taking things to stimulate your energy, like caffeine and things to boost your energy. When in fact, you just need to fix the red blood cell. So when these red blood cells um, can't fit through the capillaries, the other tissue that affects 
uh, is the eyes. This is why you have a higher incident of visual problems, um, diabetic retinopathy, where you actually can go blind because you're basically starving off the nerves that the eye needs to function. I mean, think about what the retina is. It's the extension of your brain. It's all neurological tissue. And so it needs to be fed oxygen through the vascular system. But a lot of different um, problems with the eye are related to this issue of the sugar binding to this uh, blood cell. And the term for it is called glycation, but you have negative effects to the retina. Okay. So that's going to be, you're not going to see as well. You're going to have problems like glaucoma, cataracts, you're going to have problems, uh, macular degeneration. So here you are on a high carb diet and you start to need glasses because you, you can't see. So you just keep getting thicker and thicker glasses when in reality, you need to change your diet. Now, another area of the body that's affected is your gums. Um, your gums can be more susceptible to getting an infection. It's called periodontal disease. Okay. That is another complication of this problem with the red blood cells. You also have the kidney. Okay. The kidney is very susceptible to this high level of sugar because think about what the kidneys are. They are a, these many little filters. They're filtering blood. They're like a capillary type tissue. So we're going to get a lot of destruction in the kidney and the kidney makes a certain thing called erythropoietin, which helps make red blood cells in your bone marrow. So if we don't have enough erythropoietin, then we're not going to generate the number of red blood cells. I mean, your bone marrow makes like 2 million red blood cells a second. So it's like a machine that's cranking out these red blood cells. So with the consumption of sugar, you can't make those red blood cells at the right amount. So you become anemic. So you're always kind of tired and you're always kind of uh, lacking oxygen, especially when you exercise. Now, the thing that makes your blood red is iron. Okay. And so when you have this problem with glycation, the damage uh, causes the iron to be released from the red blood cell. And then it interacts with the inside of the artery. I mean, think about um, when you expose iron to oxygen, it rusts, right? So now this iron literally creates a rusting effect because there's oxygen going on and that causes little holes in your arteries. Okay. So it increases the permeability of the artery and that's where you get um, the lesions and the start of placking and clotting. And then what happens is a band-aid is your body heals it with cholesterol, like a, a little band-aid. And what do people do? They go on a low cholesterol or low fat diet. Is that going to help? No because it's the high carb diet that's creating the whole thing in the first place. So this is why the low fat diet or the low cholesterol diet uh, is not workable for removing plaque in your arteries. So now those are some of the effects that can be created. And I'm just talking about the red blood cell. Now I want to give you a little more uh, understanding of the significance of this A1C as it relates to your blood sugars. A1C is actually a better test than testing your blood sugars because it gives you an average of your blood sugars for about three months. Okay. And you can even buy uh, home testing kits to measure your own A1C. Okay. So I'm not endorsing any, any uh, units out there, but you can look them up and buy a test to measure it yourself. But the problem with checking your blood sugars every so often is that it just shows a snapshot of what's happening right at that point. The A1C gives you an average of everything. So it's a much more accurate test for um, what's happening on average, because let's say, I don't know, you check yourself on Wednesdays and you always eat good on Wednesdays, but then the rest of the week is crappy. Uh, you'll pick this up on the A1C test. Now, a normal blood sugar should be, you know, roughly about 80, 85, okay, milligrams per deciliter, okay? And as far as A1C numbers go, that would be a 4.5% A1C, okay? And so you can see that's much less than the 5.7%, which is kind of the borderline between normal and prediabetes. And so as the blood sugars go up, the A1C goes up. So if your A1C is 7.0, percent, um, your blood sugars are going to be around 154. But if your A1C is like 13.5%, your blood sugars are like over 400. Okay. It's very, very high. Now, what does this mean about the quantity of sugar that you're eating? When you have normal blood sugars, which is, let's just say 80, okay. 80 milligrams per deciliter. That is one teaspoon of sugar, which is roughly about four grams of sugar in all of your blood. So we have about seven liters of blood, which is about a gallon and a third of blood and all that blood, one teaspoon of sugar will give you an eating of 80. Okay. Which is actually very, very small amount of sugar compared to the amount of sugar that an average person consumes. An average person in America consumes about 60 to 65% of all of their calories, carbohydrates, and these carbohydrates eventually turn into sugar. So that's a tremendous amount 
of sugar that is in our bodies. And so if your blood sugars are 80, which is normal, and you're eating a lot of sugar, how can that be? Well, it's because you have that hormone insulin that is coming in. They're working like crazy to rip all that sugar out of your, your bloodstream as fast as you put it in. Okay. But that's going to catch up with you because eventually it's going to get tired. The pancreas is going to get exhausted. And then you're going to have less and less insulin. And that's when the sugars start going higher. But just because your blood sugars are normal does not mean that sugar is not affecting other parts of the body because as the insulin goes up and it rips out this sugar and puts it, where do you think it's going? It's putting in other places in the body. It's, it's turning into a fatty liver. It's turning into problems with visceral fat. Now, this other point I want to mention is one teaspoon of sugar is what's in all of your blood, which gives you a normal blood reading of 80 milligrams per deciliter, right? Well, let's say for example, your blood sugar is 126. Okay. That's definitely above normal. How much sugar would, is in your blood to give that reading? Well, it's only one and a quarter teaspoons. So it's not that much more that is raising it all the way up to 126. So what you have to realize is it doesn't take much sugar to raise your glucose and create a higher A1C. So you might be thinking, well, I'm not, I don't eat that much sugar. It's just, just a little bit each day. Well, you're creating this effect to the red blood cell. So I just wanted to increase your awareness, but when you eat sugar and the following few hours or the day after, and you feel kind of tired or your vision is off or you get moody, now you know what's happening. Your red blood cells are becoming stiffened and they're being stuck together. So I challenge you to do an experiment, okay? In the next week, just cut out the sugar and notice how much more oxygen you have. Notice how much more energy you have because now the red blood cells are a lot more flexible. They can fit through the capillaries. They can actually deliver oxygen to your tissues, which is a really good thing. Now, if you haven't seen my video on diabetes, which I've done a long time ago, I think that would be a really good video to watch now. Check it out. I put it right here.